Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Kristen Talbot and I am the program manager for Maven Project. Thank you all for joining us today and to our friends at Clinica de la Raza for hosting today's session, Pharmacological Treatment of Anxiety Disorders at, with Dr. Judy and Smith. Dr. Smith is a general psychiatrist with a private practice in Madison, Wisconsin for 30 years, providing both psychotherapy and medications for patients. She's been a clinical adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Psych Psychiatry at the University of Wisconsin Hospital and Clinic since 1988. She teaches seminars to the residents and medical students on topics such as working with personality disorder patients, doing mental status exams, and diagnosing and treating difficult to treat psych psychiatric patients. Until 2008, she was the medical director for a mobile community outreach treatment program through the Mental Health Center of Dane County in Wisconsin, providing care for patients with severe schizophrenia. She has always loved teaching and over the years has supervised a variety of professionals in the community who are providing care to patients with a mental health diagnosis. And we are very lucky to have her as a Maven Project volunteer. So Dr. Smith, when you are ready, please begin. All right, well, welcome everybody. As she mentioned, this is, treat. it says pharmacological treatment of anxiety, but we're gonna get into a little bit more than that. All right, so disclosure, I have nothing to disclose. I have no financial investment in this. Um, we will move on. And the accreditation she went through is, um, this does qualify for CME and other educational units. All right, so why do we have anxiety? It's our alarm system, the fight or flight system. It was very adaptive during the time of tribes and cave dwellers and whatnot, watching for other tribes coming into their area or saber tooth tigers or whatever. In the modern world, we are overstimulated with images on TV, the internet, media and whatnot. And I always warn people, news sources want to sell news, that's what they sell, and they create anxiety or anger because those are ways to sell news. People then keep consuming news more. All right, so we're in a situation where we are really bombarded with images and um, anxiety producing uh, stimuli. But when there's an anxiety disorder is when the alarm system is either on too much of the time a fire alarm that's on all the time is not very useful, or the alarm system goes on or off at the wrong times, okay? Then it's not very useful. Um, there's people who have been traumatized, raped, whatever, who if they get out in a dark alleyway and there's somebody standing there, they shut down, they dissociate. So their alarm system doesn't go on when it needs to. So we can have errors in both directions where it stays on too much or goes on at the wrong time. Primates, as, as primates, we learn to fear things very easily. We're clan, we're group animals. So you don't want one monkey picking up a snake, being bitten and dying and have everyone have to do that and have your whole clan killed. So we learn with horror watching or reading on the news of something bad that happens to someone else, okay? And so we very easily learn to fear things. And anxiety develops in the very, very primitive deep part of the brain, the limbic system. We humans have this big cerebral cortex that we built around our brain. And that allows us to ruminate about our fears, all right? And think about them and plan for them and worry about them and whatnot, and we're gonna get into that further. The good news is fears can be unlearned. We have very um, plastic brains. They do, re we can rewire um, fears. And that's important too for clan animals. If a monkey, uh, if a group of monkeys goes down to a, a drinking pond um, in Africa and a crocodile comes and grabs it and eats one of them, you want all of them to run away and go to a different you know, place to drink water. But if that water hole dries up, you want them to be able to tentatively go back and maybe that crocodile's died or has moved on or whatever, that they can drink again, survival of the species, okay? Now I'm gonna talk about, as I said in the introduction, 
is not just medication, but how we rewire the brain. And um, I'm going to give you just some tips of things you could tell your patients in, in the clinic with you that don't take much time, but make a huge difference. And I'm going to get into exposure therapy and, and how that's useful with anxiety. First of all, I want to tell you how it's frequently misunderstood. So for instance, if you have a patient that comes into your office and you hear that they are having panic attacks or whatever, and they're avoiding going anywhere or to the store, um, you know, it's, you're right on to ex- encourage them to go to the store. But we want to make sure they understand that it's more than going to the store. With exposure therapy, that rewiring of the brain, what we need is not just exposure, but prolonged exposure for it to be helpful. If someone is afraid of having a panic attack at the store and goes to the store, grabs what they need and runs out, their brain does not rewire. It learns, whew, got out of that in just the nick of time, okay? So if we're encouraging people to get out, which is important to do, and I'm sure you do, we wanna make sure they know they should go to the store, but to make sure they have enough time that their anxiety can peak and come down at least 50%. Then there is remodeling of the brain, all right? And this is gonna come up multiple times in my talk, but I'm gonna give you a couple examples of extremes um, with that. One is my own phobia of bees in the past. I used to be terrified of bees and very phobic. And I would go to picnics. I was around bees all the time and it didn't get any better. So I'd go to picnics, bees would land on a pop can near me and I would kind of nonchalantly lean back. Um, If a lot of bees landed near me, I just casually get up and walk to a different picnic table. I was very nonchalant about it, but inside I was not nonchalant. And my brain never rewired because I was leaning away. I wasn't having that anxiety peak and come down at least 50% while I stayed there, okay? So then I went with my husband to Colorado and we were gonna hike up this long uh, trail, three and a half hour trail to the top of a summit and have this beautiful view. And I was very excited to do this. We started on our way and lo and behold, there were wildflowers on either side of the trail and bees were going back and forth very rapidly. I gripped my husband's arm in a death grip, probably bruised him his entire arm up and said, oh my gosh. He goes, do you want to go back? And I said, no, I want to get to the top of the mountain. I want to see this. So we kept going. And after about an hour and a half, I turned to him and I go, thank goodness the bees cleared out. And he looked around and he goes, oh, what are you talking about? There's just as many bees. But that was my perception is they'd cleared out. That was the remodeling of my brain with prolonged exposure. We got to the top, came down, and that was such long. The longer the exposure, the better the response. And really, I've not been afraid of bees since then. All right. I also want to tell you about snails. Because remember, I talked about that the limbic system in the area of fears is very deep primitive part of the brain. It's not a highly developed part. So you don't even have to believe in exposure therapy for it to work. And the best example I can give you is snails. So if you take snails and their heads are out, you have a whole bunch of them on a table and you take a syringe with cold water and you spray their heads, they'll pull their heads in. Well, you wait till the heads come out, you spray them again, their heads pull back in. You keep doing this. Eventually they get so they don't pull their heads in. If you spray them 10 times after that, they'll keep their head out for those 10 times. You put them in a box, put them aside for a week, bring them out in a week, you spray them, they pull their head back in. It has not remodeled. But if you take them and when they stop pulling their heads in, instead of just spraying them 10 times, you spray them 100 times. Then you put them in the box for a week and you bring them back out. You can spray them and they won't pull their heads in. They have rewired, and that's what we want. And we're going to use that in many of the disorders as we get going here. So when you see a patient in your office, the first thing, of course, you want to do if they are reporting a patient with anxiety, they come in saying, I'm anxious, I'm having a terrible time. 
you want to rule out medical things. And I know you guys are pros with this. So I'm just going to mention thyroid, cardiac arrhythmias, drug abuse, and of course, medication side effects, medications that were started about the time of the onset of this anxiety you want to rule out. And you're also pros at ruling out major social interpersonal stressors, abuse at home, loss of home, lack of food, et cetera, all right? We wanna make sure we rule out bipolar disorder, mania, because mania can disguise itself as anxiety. And I've seen it happen many, many times. So we wanna rule that out also. The red flags real quickly on bipolar disorder are family history of either bipolar disorder or schizophrenia increases that patient's chances of having bipolar disorder sitting in front of you 10 times, tenfold, okay? So huge factor, red flag to watch for. Depressive episodes that start before age 18 also should make you suspicious that this might be a manic or hypomanic episode. Hypersomnia, when they're depressed in a depressive phase. Um, bipolar disorder is a disorder, not of mood as much as energy. So when they're high, they're revved up. When they're low, they tend to have extreme fatigue where they getting out of the bed to go to the bathroom is a major deal. Comments from others, you seem really different. You know, I always ask it, has anyone commented? You seem really different lately, okay? And certainly a history of postpartum psychosis is almost means, almost always means they have bipolar disorder. All right. So after that, let's say you've ruled out all of those things. The next step is to figure out what kind of anxiety disorder you're dealing with because of each of them requires a, a different treatment. And at first that may sound overwhelming of, oh my gosh, I have to give a different questionnaire for everything. I'm gonna try and give you some simple questions to kind of sort them through. Um, but you can see the list here, we agitated depression, OCD, all the ones we're gonna be addressing today. Okay. So questions that I always wanna ask is, when did it start, okay? If they also had depression, when in relation to the depression? And we'll get into that in more detail. What percent of each time, day do they spend feeling anxious? Or each week, what, you know, how much time do they spend feeling anxious? Oh, 10%, 5%, 80%, okay? What sets off the anxiety or makes it worse, okay? And this is a huge one, for instance, someone who's avoiding going to the grocery store. It's incredibly helpful to say, what are you afraid will happen if you go to the grocery store, okay? Someone with PTSD may say, oh, the millet, they have a military station right near the grocery store. And I run into people in military uniforms, it just sets off my, sets off my panic with it, okay? Someone with social anxiety disorder will go, I have to do it with the clerk at the checkout. And I'm afraid I'll say something stupid and then I ruminate about it for hours, okay? Someone with panic disorder will always say, I'm afraid I'll feel incredibly anxious and have an anxiety attack. They're afraid of the anxiety, that's it. That's panic disorder almost always. How quickly does it reach a peak is also important. Because with general anxiety disorder, that usually builds over several hours, whereas panic attack, onset comes on and it reaches a peak in a couple mix minutes, max five minutes, okay? Do they have ruminative? I just add that in at the last thing. Ruminative and repetitive behaviors and or thoughts to just grab the OCD, all right. So now we're gonna go through each of these. Agitated depression, we talked about is the patient depressed as well as anxious. The next question I wanna know is, did the anxiety predate the depression? And let's talk about what that means. If the onset is about the same time, then it could be, then most likely it's agitated depression. And why that's significant is if it's agitated depression, then you're open to using any of these antidepressant 
okay? Bupropion works as well as your SSRIs and SNRIs. Vortioxetine, same thing, okay? Works as well as the SSRIs and SNRIs that are known for helping with anxiety. They're equal e efficacy in that situation. However, if the patient had long-standing anxiety, now I'm gonna say the anxiety can come on before the depression in agitated depression, but usually only about like two months, two months, few weeks to two months, something like that. If they've had anxiety going on for years before they get depressed, then they've got an anxiety disorder and depression. And then it's really, I would choose to give them a medication that works for both the anxiety and the depression. Your SNRIs, your SSRIs, tricyclic antidepressants, that's not my first choice, but they work well for both of those two as do MI inhibitors. Okay. All right. So let's go into obsessive compulsive disorder first. Um, so what are obsessions and compulsions? I'm sure you remember this, but I'll just review it quickly. Obsessions are the circular thoughts. I always tell people it's like a skip in a record. It keeps going around and around and around. Years ago, I'll age myself, but years ago when I would get on domestic airplanes, they would have a, an image on the window that said, do not open in flight of your window, passenger window. And I'm... Um, I never saw any of the latches. It's just strange, but they always had that on the window. And um, I remember always having the thought, gosh, what if I did? And then I would let go of it. And years later, I read that 98% of people that got into airlines with that on the window thought, but what if I did? The difference is someone with OCD will think I might do it. Oh my gosh, what if I do? and they can't let go of it. It's a skip in the record. It just keeps going again and again, okay? Those are the obsessions, contaminated hands, whatever it might be. The compulsions are the actions or thoughts used to try to relieve the anxiety, washing off the germs. Oops, what if I hit someone with my car on the way to work and I didn't realize I'm gonna drive around the block. The compulsion is driving around the block to look if there's a body there. But what if I didn't see it? What if I missed it? I better drive a ground again, okay? Those are the compulsions. Compulsions can be thoughts too. Um, I'm gonna say uh, the Lord's Prayer 15 times and that will undo. Uh, so nothing bad happens to my mother or to my spouse what, or my child, whatever. But what I always wanna tell patients is, that with OCD, they will get an immediate relief by doing the compulsion. It'll make the anxiety a little better, but the next time it makes the anxiety worse and it actually makes the disorder worse, okay? It's like a hit of heroin, temporarily re reduces the um, pain, but ends up making a bigger mess of things. All right. This is one of the toughest disorders to treat with medication. And that's why I don't only talk about medications. We're talking about at best 50% of people with OCD get better with medications. And of those, on average, they get better about 30 to 40% at best. So you leave a lot of symptoms, okay? So don't be surprised when you experience that with patients. It's worth treating them with meds, but know that that is a small part of the treatment. The best treatments by far are cognitive behavioral therapy and exposure with response prevention, okay? So when you're gonna refer your patients with OCD on for therapists, Google in looking for therapists that are certified in working with CBT and exposure. They may need, you know, psychodynamic therapy for relationship issues, but that's not how their OCD should be treated. You want to make sure you get a therapist um, uh, really trained in that uh, treatment. And by the way, just so you know what exp uh, exposure with response prevention is, 
and we'll be getting into CBT a little bit more too. Example, if someone's afraid of contamination, I might, you know, I'm in the office with them, I might lick my finger, touch the bottom of my shoe, put it back in my tongue and go, now you do it. And then we, I say, and then we're going to have you not spit it out, rinse your mouth or anything else. Anxiety peak, come down at least 50%. And I explain that to them. And that's the kind of techniques they do with the patients. Okay. Um, so we get the exposure to sitting with that anxiety. Into the meds, SSRIs and SNRIs are the first line medication treatment. We do, you've probably heard before, you want higher doses usually with this, you know, but I start low and gradually increase the dose as, as needed. And it usually takes longer to work. I have eight to 12 weeks in this, I think at least 12 weeks to get a response, um, give it plenty of time. Okay, well, let's say the SSRIs um, and SNRIs don't work fully or don't work at all. All right, what's our next in line? Um, the next in line we think of usually is clomipramine. That's a tricyclic antidepressant, but it's the only tricyclic that works. It works, it increases serotonin as do the SSRIs and SNRIs. So it's not surprising that this one works. And the good news, I mean, this is slightly more effective than your SSRIs and SNRIs. Um, about half the studies show it more effective, half the studies find it equally effective. And when you see that kind of pattern, usually means it's a little more effective. And that has been most of our uh, uh, psychiatrist experience with it, okay? We don't go with it first because it tends to have more side effects like the tricyclics dry mouth, constipation, dizziness, and things like that. If you have a patient who has a partial response to an SSRI or an SNRI, you can add on some clomipramine to augment. So in that case, I'm gonna start on the clomipramine at 25 milligrams at bedtime and gradually increase it up to tolerability or 75 milligrams at bedtime if needed. Um, you want to check the drug interaction. There are a few of the SSRIs that do up the blood level of clomipramine, and then you're going to want to be even more careful, maybe keep it more around 50 milligrams uh, max. Let's say you get no response to an SSRI and then an SNRI trial, and you decide you're going to try something else. It's no, there's no reason to keep them on those anymore then you would you can switch them over to clomipramine alone. Then I would start with 50 milligrams at bedtime and gradually increase it to 250 milligrams at bedtime or up to tolerability uh, and see you know, what's needed dose-wise and how it's tolerated. Okay. Benzodiazepines are a total no-no with OCD. They are ineffective. They make absolutely no improvement in the disorder and they interfere with the most effective treatment which is exposure and cbt i'll remind you of the bad you know i mean the limited results we get with medication in general you don't want to interfere with the treatment that it's most effective okay. now what if you try clomipramine and um or you're not comfortable trying clomipramine? that's okay it's not one you use, you're just not comfortable. And the SSRI alone was not enough or the SNRI alone was not enough. What are some other augmentation strategies? The first line after clomipramine, the best data is your antipsychotics. Low dose, we're not talking high dose. Risperidone, one to two milligrams a day added on to your SSRI or SNRI has the best data available but aripiprazole is also quickly getting more and more studies showing that that is also very effective and it's better tolerated than risperidone. Um, so you can try one than the other or whichever way you wanna go. Uh, aripiprazole, I start very low, two milligrams, sometimes go up to 10. Usually I stay more lower dose with that, um, two to five milligrams, but certainly can go up to 10 milligrams with that. 
let's say they can't tolerate the anti antipsychotic, you're not comfortable with the clomipramine or they don't tolerate that. A couple of other augmentation strategies to add on to the SSRIs or SNRIs would be amantadine, very well tolerated medicine and one you use frequently in other th for other things, 100 to 200 milligrams per day. Small studies support this, not big controlled studies, but small studies have shown some pretty good data. Okay. Methylphenidate, strangely enough, I don't know the mechanism that's hypothesized with that, um, but it's specifically methylphenidate, not Adderall or um, uh, the amphetamines. Um, so metal, methylphenidate, five to 15 milligrams per day. And again, if it doesn't make a difference, I would take them off. But that's another option of something that you probably already use sometimes that you can try. All right, so moving on, social phobia. This one, in contrast to OCD, is really quite straightforward to treat. And people have pretty good responses. SSRIs and SNRIs are both quite effective. And sometimes people respond better to one than another. Um, and it might be trying several different ones to find what works best for your patient or that they tolerate best. Um, we, in psychiatry, use MRI inhibitors and they're very effective. They're actually more effective than SSRIs or SNRIs, but they're very difficult to use. I'd leave that for the psychiatrist. Um, they are a pain to use. Um, gabapentin is also very helpful and one that you could consider using. It can even be used PRN for people with social phobia that they can sometimes use them in that way. Um, 100 milligrams to 900 milligrams three times a day. Um, they don't have to be scheduled, but you know, as I said, PRN. But by the way, I, I'm assuming most of you know you can't go above 900 milligrams in an individual dose. And it's not because of side effects or whatever, but the body doesn't absorb more than none. 900 milligrams in a dose. And that's why the maximal dose is 2,400 of this medicine a day, but you can't make it 1,200 B BID or it's just wasted medicine. Might as well go with 900 BID if the patient can't get in three times a day dosing. Okay, general anxiety disorder. All right, we talked about separating this from a panic disorder, panic attack, very simply with the five minute rule, you know, that general anxiety tends to come on in the morning, build, or um, but it builds over several hours or a panic attack comes on, reaches a peak within five minutes. Um, all right, so now we're going to talk about medicine treatment for this. And I'm going to talk about effect size. And I know you are probably very familiar with effect size, but I'm going to explain how I think about it because it's kind of, I find it a useful format. So when you look at effect size, I always think below 0 0.2 is placebo. It's, it's doing nothing. The meta is doing absolutely nothing in the studies. No better than placebo. 0 to 0.2 to 0 0.4 is a small effect. At that level, the patient feels better, but their family members can't usually see much of a difference and you won't be able to in the office. From 0 0.5 to 0 0.7, you've got a medium effect size. And that's where the patient feels a lot better. And their family can notice a difference. And you'll notice a difference when they're in the office with you. At 0 0.8 and above, this is a really large effect size. And then it's, it's life-changing for them. It really makes a huge difference. Okay, so let's look at the different medicines we use in psychiatry and where they, for general anxiety disorder or not, and where they fall with this. Let's start with bordeoxetine and bupropion, 0 0.12. Doesn't do anything for general anxiety disorder. Down at placebo. Might as well give them a sugar pill or whatever, nothing. Um, and um, just a reminder, that's different if they've got agitated depression. So. We always, that's why we want to rule that out. Then bupropion works very well to lift the anxiety associated with agitated depression. Buspirone, marketed for general anxiety disorder. It's below 0 0.2. It's no better than placebo in recent st studies. 
and we really don't use it anymore in psychiatry with probably the exception that some of us have found it to be useful added on for PTSD to an SSRI or an SNRI with some patient, individual patients. General anxiety disorder is not showing any improvement over placebo. SSRIs, 0.33. Now you got someone who says, yeah, I'm feeling better. That's really helping. But, you know, usually doesn't make a huge difference where family members or you will notice a difference. SNRIs, slightly improved, 0.36, about the same as SSRIs. Recent data suggesting that difference may be that SNRIs work with people with high inflammation, okay, um, where SSRIs don't. So that's something to think about, but that's another talk. Okay, okay, pregabalin. And now I'm going to say pregabalin and gabapentin. Gabapentin got in a whole, I mean, Neurontin, the brand name, got in a whole lot of trouble when they first came on the market and for seizures and whatnot. And they tried to market it for anxiety before they got any indication. They got their hand slapped. They got more than their hand slapped. They got a huge lawsuit and they were never able to study that. There were no, they didn't fund any studies for anxiety because of what they did. They had their drug reps coming in saying, by the way, it works for anxiety. But our feeling is that it does work about the same as pregabalin. We'll get into that, which a measures out at about 0 0.5 in a 2007 study, 0 0.38 in a 2017 study. But the 2017 study was probably not real accurate because there was a high placebo rate in that study. So kind of an artificially um, some problem with this study. Hydroxyzine, 0 0.45. So good results with that too. Benzodiazepine, about the same as your hydroxyzine, 0 0.5 to 0. Um, 0 0.4 to 0 0.5. Psychotherapy, 0 0.5. Selexin, which I'll be getting into, 0 0.86. Now we're getting a big effect size. And quetiapin knocks it out of the ballpark, 1.6. We're going to talk about that. So gabapentin, as I talked about, um, doesn't have an indication and will never have an indication. Uh, now that's generic, but 100 milligrams to 900 milligrams three times a day or pregabalin, 75 milligrams BID to 300 milligrams BID. Um, and at lower doses, they can be used PRN. By the way, I, most of us find gabapentin a little bit more tolerable. So I often pick it first but pregabalin seems just a little more effective, but more side effects, kind of like the SSRIs, SNRIs, just slight difference, okay? And by the way, these, this choice is especially good for pain conditions because it can help with that too. Um, benzodiazepines do work for general anxiety disorders, we mentioned, uh, long acting, obviously, for the regular scheduled use, clonazepam, short acting, for sure you're acting lorazepam, whatnot. I like lorazepam because it can be used under the tongue. It's so small tablet, it dissolves and goes right to the brain without bypassing the liver. So people can get a response in five to 10 minutes. And that becomes really handy with someone who has panic attacks that they can carry it with them and know they can get relief within five minutes. And so that they often don't need to take it. It has a wonderful paradoxical Thing with that. All right, quetiapin. So um, the FDA was very aware the drug company, Seroquel, uh, presented the data on anxiety because it knocked it out of the park, ballpark. And presented this to the FDA and they acknowledged, yep, that works very well for anxiety, but they did not give approval because they knew there were so many side effects with quetiapin, increased heart, you know, heart problems, uh, increased sudden death, um, particularly in older people, um, you know, increased lipids, increased blood sugars, all the complications of quetiapin. They were worried that half our country would be on quetiapin, okay? So it did not get FDA approval for anxiety, but it works. 
So where we tend to use it is with disabling general anxiety disorder when everything else has been tried and the patient is really disabled by the anxiety or anxiety with bipolar disorder where the quetiapine can be used to also manage the mood disorder. Now I'm gonna talk about Selexin. Remember we talked about that had an effect size of about 0.8. Selexin is an herbal agent and that's why you don't hear about it because it doesn't have any big company marketing and funding studies here in the United States. It's a branded extract of lavender. It's a prescription medication in 14 European countries. And in most of that, it's their first line treatment for general anxiety disorder. In the US, it is available as Calm Aid through Schwabi's Nature's Way line. Okay? If you don't wanna use that brand, you can also check consumerlab.com. It's a, it's a um, company that checks all herbal agents. It's wonderful. Checks them for contaminants because I always fear recommending any you know, herbal agents um, that they may have contaminants in them or not have what they say they do. And they check for both of those things. It used to be free, um, but now it's, I think it's about $25 per year prescription to be able to get, um, uh, I mean, subscription to be able to be a member of it. Anyway, uh, dose is 80 to 160 milligrams QHS. It only works with general anxiety disorder. It's not work panic disorder, social phobia, OCD. And it's not a PRN. It's, it takes two to five weeks to take it there, okay? In the main study uh, in the US that was looked that looked at using Calm Aid at 80 to 160 milligrams a day with, they had 539 patients on it for 10 weeks. Double blind study with placebo and using paroxetine 20 milligrams per day, which by the way is very good anti-anxiety. It's very calming then it has other you know, side effects. So we often don't use it as often. It did significantly better than paroxetine and placebo. 50% of the patients on 160 milligrams of Calm Aid had complete remission of their general anxiety disorder. Pretty impressive. Side effects were about the same as placebo with some burping, and it has very weak estrogen-like properties. So um, they has some rare case reports in Europe of uh, gynecomastia in uh, teenage males. So we recommend you avoid using it in um, males under age 18. Um, and I also always recommend that people, uh, women who have breast cancer or a history of breast cancer, that they get approval for the, through their oncologist to use this. Um, it's a, it, you do need to know this study is a manufacturer funded study. So with that in mind, and the remainder studies that there are are pretty small but I've seen some very impressive results with it and well tolerated. Um, and I just wanna let you know this, this is not ready for, for prime time use, but it's coming in the, it just came out in the news July of 2022, 20, uh, a study treating general anxiety disorder with high dose vitamin B6. They had 478 young adults, it was a good study double blind for one month um, and 150 milligrams of vitamin B6. Now, just so you know, a comparison, the recommended dietary intake for a male is 1.3 milligrams a day and for females, 1.5 milligrams. So it's, it's a mega dose. And we don't know that this is the dose that needs to be yet. That's, that's just used in this study. It, but it's significantly reduced anxiety over placebo. Um, and there's reasons for, reasons for it, which is vitamin B6. It seems it increases the inhibitory uh, GABAergic effects in the body. So we'll wait and see what's coming with this. There's another study, smaller study done with 80 milligrams. So we don't know what the dose may be, but this may be a nice viable option for helping with general anxiety disorder. Panic disorder, are panic attacks out of the blue or precipitated? We need to know that because panic disorder 
panic attacks happen with many things, okay? Panic attacks can be due to PTSD, OCD, oh my gosh, I didn't wash my hands, I'm gonna kill my kids, I contaminate them, whatever it might be. They can have a full-blown panic attack. Simple phobias, social phobia, um, performance anxiety. You can get panic attacks with all these things. But a panic attack, panic disorder has a panic attack, at least one that's out of the blue. And it certainly is the first one is out of the blue. People with panic disorder will always, or even panic attacks, always remember their first panic attack. And they can go, if you ask them, do you remember when the first panic attack was? Oh my gosh, yes. They can tell you exactly where and what, but they'll say, yeah, it just came out of the blue. Now I say that they initially at least are out of the blue because the first one might be when they're watching TV or they're driving their car, but they'll begin to think, oh, uh, it's when I drive a car. That set it off. They begin to look what caused it. And so they begin to think maybe it is an out of the blue. And their anticipatory anxiety of being in those same situations make it more likely for them to have panic attacks. So it becomes a self-fulfilling um, prophecy. But if you look at it further, what are you most afraid of to get in the car? I'll have a panic attack, okay? Um, let's go. Um, when you do see it's a panic disorder, then you want to know, is there agoraphobia? Are they avoiding going out, get it, going to the store? Are they avoiding anything? I always ask, are you avoiding doing anything that you used to do or doing less of something you used to do because of fear of having a panic attack? Because we want to get them immediately doing those things with the prolonged exposure. ASAP or we get more and more disability and the panic disorder gets worse. Okay. Relaxation therapy makes it worse. Just relax. Doesn't work. It actually makes it worse. Think of a beautiful island you're on. Makes it worse. Isn't that interesting? However, deep breathing. You, I know you all probably teach your patients deep breathing, you know, whatever number you use, breathe into seven, hold it for a count of seven or eight exhale for seven, whatever is very useful because there's a parasympathetic nervous system network right under the diaphragm. When you hold that, it's stimulating the brake system of the nervous system. So it works well, but let's make it also, you can teach them real quickly in your office how to do cognitive therapy while they're doing it, which makes it even better, which is I have my patients say to themselves, oh, I'm having a panic attack. I know what this is. I have a genetic predisposition to a spontaneous release of the hormones involved in fight or flight. It's as if my body thinks there's a lion at my door, but there's no lion there. So, oh yeah, I feel my heart beating really fast. Oh yeah, I know what that is. That's that hormone making my, body, my heart beat fast so I can fight or flee. Oh, I got tingling in my fingers and toes. Oh yes. I know what that is. I'm constricting my blood vessels so the blood will go to my big muscles so I can fight or flee. Oh, my stomach's feeling kind of queasy. Oh, I know what that is. That's to bypass my stomach digestion so it'll go to the big muscles so I can fight or flee. So I want them to lean into the anxiety and think what's going on. That's exposure therapy that they can do right in the midst of it with their breathing, okay? Now, going to the medication, SSRIs and SNRIs are your best treatment, um, and it works well for panic disorder. You can often completely prevent panic disorder. Medicines work well. The key is starting very low. You've got to start extremely low. It's as if their nerves are hyper-responsive and stimulated to the SSRIs and SNRIs, and if you start at uh, you know, your usual doses for depression or general anxiety disorder, they'll jump off, off the chair and they won't go on the medicine again. So for instance, if I'm going to use sertraline, I start with 12.5 milligrams. Um, or um, escitalopram, I'm going to start with 2.5. Really slow, break the pill, get it down there. Um, and I warn them, you're still going to feel a little anxious when you first started. That's just 
the, the nerves haven't had enough serotonin for a while. They're kind of over, they go wacky when you first get it, then it'll calm down within a week or two and go away. Then we can increase it normally. Um, and um, I tell them to call me if they have too much anxiety and they feel, oh man, this it will go even lower. So now panic disorder, benzodiazepines are also very effective, but they're hard to taper off. The panic attacks usually return. Whereas with SSRIs and SNRIs, you can do some cognitive behavioral therapy and taper them off. And usually they do pretty well with that. Okay. Simple phobias, exposure therapy, like might be, I won't go further, benzodiazepines, flying. Some people say, I only fly every three years. I don't want to mess with that. And by the way, same thing, one hour flight isn't going to do anything. Probably it's just going to be, few. I got out of there in the nick of time. But a trip to Europe or Africa or Asia, now that's an opportunity for exposure therapy, but they can't use the benzodiazepines at the same time. Performance anxiety, you guys know this, propranolol 10 to 40 milligrams one hour before public performance. Usually do a trial, um, find the dose that works for the patient, several trials, have them check their pulse uh, hour after taking it, make sure it's not below 50. Okay. No reduction in anxious thoughts, I warn them. It just reduces the phys physical responses to anxiety, which helps them feel more confident. And it helps improve performance in many things, um, including musicians. 25% of musicians were found quite a few years ago, this study was done in large orchestras to take it on a regular basis. PTSD, therapy is the most effective treatment by far. Exception, someone who only wants meds. They're not willing or wanting to do it, then that's the best treatment. Effect size is almost 1.0. Therapy is very effective for, expo for PTSD, as long as that's that EMD, I mean, not EMDR, exposure therapy. EMDR, by the way, that's where the eyes go back and forth while they're retelling the story of the trauma. And the key with that, the eyes going back and forth just gives the patient something to kind of focus on that helps calm them so they can tell the story. But the main part that makes it work is exposure therapy. And there's many forms of exposure therapy for trauma, and all of those are good. What we don't want the patient doing is telling what happened to them kind of quickly in the office, like after a trauma they found that actually makes it worse to just do a quick telling. It has to be the prolonged exposure where the anxiety peaks and comes back down. So talking about it in detail over a prolonged time, okay? Medication have relatively low effect size, 0 0.2 to 0 0.6. Benzodiazepines are bad, bad, bad with PTSD. Multiple studies, they make it worse. Symptoms interfere with symptoms. I mean, make the symptoms worse, but they also interfere with the exposure therapy. By the way, a side note, high incidence of sleep apnea in patients with PTSD. 45 to 75% of patients with PTSD have sleep apnea. So always question about this if you see someone. Um, and these will be slim young people, not people you would expect to have sleep apnea, okay? They think it's a, a damage to the central nervous system since with all that adrenaline, cortisol run, running around in their bodies and it actually damages the breathing, the central nervous system. Um, with the trauma, okay? Okay, so quickly, PTSD meta-analysis of a different medication was done, 58 trials, 26 different meds, and almost 7,000 patients were involved in this meta-analysis. It compared the effect size with each of these different medicines and looked in 26 different medicines, okay? And these are the seven medicines, the only seven medicines that, um, came out above placebo effect. Topiramate, risperidone, quetiapin, paroxetine, venlafaxine, fluoxetine, and sertraline. It's the only ones, okay? None of the other medications beat placebo. Fluoxetine was the most tolerable, but the effect size for benefit was small, 0 0.2 to 0 0.3. And, and that's true with most of the other medicines, except for topiramate, risperidone, and quetiapin. 
they had the best effect, effect at 0 0.5 to 0 0.6. You remember that quetiapin, okay? But toxic side effects, all right? Um, so um, the effect size for the other medicines, as I mentioned, 0 0.2 to 0 0.3, you need to know, though, of these studies, they were most all quite small studies. Now, that always makes the results less reliable. When you're looking down at 0 0.2, 0 0.3, might it be that escitalopram does work as well as fluoxetine, but it just didn't make it in that study? Could be, you know. So, but I choose to select from this group of seven because... It's got the data supported. Let's talk about topiramate up there, 0 0.5 to 0.6, quite effective. Reduces the re-experiencing nightmares, startle reflex and dissociation. It's particularly good with patients with PTSD and alcohol abuse since it helps with both. Um, they're not big studies though with any of these PTSD um, studies but there were two um, small studies, 78 patients, and two other recent uh, smaller studies, also positive, um, showing good results with this and helping in many of the symptoms of PTSD. Um, you do wanna monitor for side effects. I've listed them there and I know you're familiar with those. Um, you start with 25 milligrams at HS at bedtime and increase by 25 milligrams Q, Q week until you get a response or side effects. Um, let's talk about PTSD and nightmare. Triazodone is often first line for a lot of people. I know you guys use that, um, but in, in PTSD clinics, they often use that first line for insomnia nightmares and PTSD. It helps with both the insomnia and the nightmares. Prazosin, I know you, is kind of, has this magic around it. Um, and we use it at one milligram at HS and slowly increase it to a maximum 10 milligrams QHS. And I say it has magic around, it, but recently the studies have shown it to not be any better than placebo, several fairly good studies. So it's really mixed results right now. We don't know what to think. They're still using it in the um, PTSD clinic is my under uh, clinics is my understanding, and they often even use it BID, you know, five milligrams BID and feel it helps with some of the startle, all of those other flashback kind of symptoms. But the studies are not, recent studies haven't supported it real well. Do avoid Remeron or Mirtazapine, okay? Um, it's a sedating medicine, so some people try that for helping sleep, but in PTSD, there's a, I won't go into it, but Chemically, there's a reason of a receptor it hit, it hits that increases nightmares. Stay away from it. Clonidine is often the first choice in um, PTSD clinics rather than praises in because it's quite sedating. And so they often use that starting with 0 0.1 milligram at bedtime. Cognitive behavioral therapy. I wanna tell you this because you can teach your patients right in the clinic. Um, it is the most effective treatment. There is better than any of these medicines for sleep. And what that is, is I always ask a patient and they say, I have terrible nightmares. It's just awful. And I say, what do you do when you wake up after a nightmare? And I, they often read something or they get up or they cry or they go walking around or whatever. And I say, I want you to do the following. I want you to sit up in your bed and I want you to fantasize finishing that nightmare. I want you to finish it and finish it the way you would want it to end. And this is your fantasy and you can make it anything you want, but I want it, you to be victorious. I want you to be powerful and to take care of the situation. You can grow to yourself if you're being raped, uh, uh, I mean, uh, chased by a rapist. You can go uh, grow 20 feet tall, grab the rapist, throw them in prison, break them in half, whatever you want to do. You can bring police in to catch them. You can bring your partner in in your fantasy to beat them up. Now, I've had patients when I go through this will say, I, I, I can't imagine growing big. I could never imagine that. They've been so traumatized in their life. Or I can't imagine bringing anyone in. I wouldn't feel safe. And then I ask, do you like animals? 
Do you have a dog? Do you like dogs? Do you like lion? What do you like? Elephants stomp them. Um, bring in five vicious dogs. And they smile with delight at this. So look for something, but they finish that in their fantasy and they write it down. They do this and you see those nightmares just disappear. It's really magical. It's very fun to do with your patient. And be sure to rule out sleep apnea. So in <laughs> summary, we're done. We won't even do the summary. I've gone way too long. All no, right. I'm just giving you the five minute warning. So you could, uh, if you want to do your summary, you're good. If not, we All can. Right. Uh... All right. So first you want to know what type of anxiety you're dealing with and if it's agitated depression and of course rule out bipolar disorder and medical things, but you're great at that. Prolonged exposure is useful for many types of anxiety to remodel the brain. We have a very plastic remodel, a brain that's very, very capable of remodeling, but it has to be done right. And most of the failures with remodeling of the brain with anxiety is because the people didn't know about the prolonged exposure. Medications can make a huge difference in anxiety. But some of the medicines like benzodiazepines in some disorders can um, interfere with the treatment and not make it better. Patients' preference for psychotherapy and meds does predict their best response. And that's it. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you. Just remember, if you have any questions, put them into the Q&A box right now. We have a comment that says, you were spectacular. And I love that oh, one. So thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. I uh, hope it was helpful and not too overwhelming. Okay, first question. Is there a role for Buscar at first line treatment in adolescent anxiety? I've seen some early report, reports, but your talk indicates poor response size. I'm sorry, say in, in adolescence, is there a rule of- Is there a, a role? It's my oh, my coming out. <laughs> I'm not a child person. Let me hang on one second. I want to see what they say about abuse. I always have a child. Let's see what they say about abuse bar in it. Oh, I'm in pediatric. They, here's what, um, See if they, I just wondered if they'd say anything. Okay, here's, here's what I'm gonna read in my pediatric. Although very well tolerated, random, randomized placebo controlled data found buspirone 15 to 16 milligrams per day to be no better than placebo in kids six to 17 years with general anxiety disorder. So there you go. So they, they're experiencing the same thing we are, okay. We have another comment. I like your talk, very well organized and love all the examples and practical tips. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay, I don't see any other questions, but we'll, we'll pause, don't worry. Um, if you do have a question, you think about it afterwards, you can always use the VC platform, submit your consult. Dr. Smith can answer that way. You could try to set up a, a video consult if that would also be helpful, uh, but you can do that with all of our volunteers for all of our specialties not just <laughs> all right i don't see any other comments so thank you all for joining us today dr smith thank you i'm so glad you could log on <laughs> that was a thank you you guys for having me in and okay. good luck with all you do yes you will have access to the slides um tomorrow about 24 hours from the start date as email from zoom will be sent out and you will um get the slide deck and the cme survey if you miss it today there is one question um, how do you treat if there are multiple anxiety disorders present like OCD, social phobia, and GAD? Uh, and GAD? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you've got OCD. Tell me the other. Um, social? Uh, <laughs> I have to scroll down. OCD, social phobia, and GAD. Okay. So the good news is that an SSRI or SNRI you know, I'd look under those categories of what, you know, on my slides and what fits in there. So you got an SSRI or an SNRI are going to certainly be quite effective with the social anxiety disorder and that it will help with the general anxiety disorder. And then you've got the OCD, it 
helps with that, but remember that one's really tough to treat. So then we start looking is, do we need to add something in on that? But your SSRIs and SNRIs are gonna do something for all three of those, okay? Thank you. All right. Well, then we will definitely say goodbye here. Thank you all again. Thank you, Dr. Smith. You bet. Thank you, you guys. Take care.